Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Welcome to episode 5 in the Shakedown blog series on Chris Watts. And this episode is titled, A Golden Boy Destined for Greatness, which is a quote from the Shakedown blog posted on August 22nd, 2018. So this is very early in the game and at this point we knew very little about Chris Watts. And at this point, Nicole Kessinger was actually still giving her various versions of events in sort of multiple interviews. So it was very, very early. You know, at this point, it was less than 10 days after the crime had actually happened. So I'm not going to go through the section dealing with Shanann and the finances. You're welcome to go to the blog post and read about that. I'm not going to deal with section B either about selling a fairy tale or faking a fairy tale. Again, if you want to read that on your own, you're welcome. Just head on to the blog post. Uh, It is linked in the description. And so we're going to start off with a section dealing with, um, you know, where we need to be looking at, which is where there was less information. We had a lot of information at that point about Shanann. All you had to do was go onto her Facebook to get a sense of who she was. But Chris Watts was much harder to come by, information about him, what kind of person he was. So, but before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do. Like, share, leave a comment. And let's get started. So, since there's less information about the murderer at this point, this is what is written on the 22nd of August. I said, that's really where we need to look to move the narrative along. How was he faking it? What was his fairy tale for himself? So I'd already established that a lot of what seemed to be happening here was someone trying to live their version of a fairy tale in Frederick, right? Shanann being one person and the other person being Chris Watts. And you could kind of get the sense of what Shanann's fairy tale was. It was basically having children and living a particular lifestyle. But what was his fairy tale? What was Chris Watts' fairy tale for himself? And at this point, I was still comparing him to Scott Peterson. I was saying that Scott Peterson's fairy tale was golf. Scott saw himself as a pro golfer who missed the train and missed the glory that would have or should have followed. Now, as you'll see when you become more and more familiar with true crime, a fairy tale is something that um, adults sometimes have trouble letting go of, right? Let me say that again. In true crime, again and again, you get the sense that a fairy tale is something that, that an adult sometimes has trouble letting go of. And I think that is true with us as well, just with ordinary people. Sometimes it's hard letting go of a version that we've had of ourselves, a version that other people have had of us, a version of, that society has had, a version that the opposite sex has had of us. Um, it's sometimes hard to let go of that role, the role that we predicted for ourselves, the role that was basically laid out for us. And when it it starts to not go that way. It can bring about an existential crisis. It can also bring about, you know, in a marriage or in a particular situation where there's stress and anxiety, you might start feeling a sense of despair, a sense of urgency that, you know, I'm not going in the right direction. I need to get off this train because I'm not going where I, where I want to go. I'm not going where I need to go. I'm not going where I'm where I feel like I'm supposed to be going. And so there's an article in on patch.com which s- revealed the fairy tale that, that Chris Watts was caught up in. So, you know, within nine days of this crime taking place, you already had this, had this information coming through. And bear in mind, you know, you had um, programs like uh, Ashley Banfield was doing on HLN that every single day they were bringing out some new um, information, new revelations on the Chris Watts case. And so this is one of them. And so the question was, so what were Chris Watts's delusions? You know, and did he also have delusions of grandeur? You might say, you know, Shanann um, was, 
you know, living beyond or, or kind of pushing the family to live beyond their means. Well, what about Chris Watts? And, and my impression was that he was quite conservative with money in, in a way. He, he wasn't all that ostentatious, although he seemed to like s- certain kinds of clothing and so on. But the the answer to that question was quite quite different and, and in kind of a subtle way. He did have delusions of grandeur, but the important part to remember was that that they'd been part of his backstory. So you kind of got the sense that somewhere along the line, he'd given up on the Chris Watts that he, he thought he was going to be. And I think that is why the affair was such a powerful kickstarter to him, because it was almost a reminder of the Chris Watts that, that, he, that he thought was possible at one point. And now he was being awakened to those possibilities again through this experience with this other woman. In any event, like all delusions, they started off with a little bit of reality supporting them. And this is a quote from Patch.com. Watts was one of the best students I had ever had. Oh my God, this is a shock. Retired teacher Joe Duty told the Fayetteville Observer. Watts graduated from Pine Forest High School in 2003 and won a $1,000 scholarship to a technical institutes or to technical institutes in his home state. And that's the end of the quote. So you actually had a teacher giving this this kind of glowing endorsement from 15 years earlier, just saying, you know, this this was an incredible kid, you know, at school. He was, he was really one of the best kids I'd ever had. Um, I'm shocked by this, right? And I'm not even sure if Shanann got that sort of, um, endorsement from her teachers. I think she was well liked. I think even by the the same teacher. I think Joe Duty also said something about Shanann. I think he said, um, or oh, sorry, that is Joe Beach, a former neighbor in Aberdeen. He was just saying that you know she seemed happy or something like that. But there was another teacher who gave a different story about Shanann. That that Shanann was a bit of a wounded individual in high school. Um, a bit of a, a wallflower, someone with perhaps a bit of a confidence problem, but someone who was nevertheless, you know, um, she had quite a good uh, relationship with this particular teacher. So going a bit further, um, what seemed to be a promising start, he seemed to be a hardworking student, and so there seemed to be a lot of hope and expectation that he was carrying with him for himself. In the Peterson case, there's the lie that Peterson won a golf scholarship. So that's quite interesting that not only did he want to play golf, but there was actually a fiction surrounding him actually winning a golf scholarship. In any event, he has a crucial insight. Again, bear in mind when it came out nine days after the incident, right? Again, this is also from his former school teacher. He said, the guy had a photographic memory. I said, Chris, if ever... If I ever had a student who was going to be tremendously successful, it's you. According to Duty's recollection, Watts in high school aspired to be a NASCAR crew chief technician, but instead Watts worked until Wednesday at Anadarka Oil & Gas, earning around $60,000 a year, according to bankruptcy records filed in 2015. So if you take the thing of you going to be tremendously successful, to bankruptcy filing in 2015 and then the same thing kind of happening again and I remember when he was interviewed you know or interrogated him saying he really never expected to be in that position twice I don't think he expected to be in it once but when it happened again I I think he felt like you know I'm in a nightmare that I'm trying to get out of and he used those words during the sermon on the porch those words were, I think, a reference to the financial situation, which I suspect he he blamed on somebody else. And I think he had a, a role to play in that in the sense of, um, you know, he should have taken control of the finances if he wasn't happy with where they were going. You know, and I think part of why he didn't was he didn't have the right personality for that. And then you've got to say... Well, whose fault is that? Did he need to step up or did, um, you know, it's quite difficult to say if you, your personality prevents you from being a certain way, it's quite difficult to say, well, you should have done something. 
um, one does get the sense that he was trying to do something. Of course, what he did in the end wasn't um, the sort of thing any normal person would do, right? And so anyway, reading between the lines, even his teacher th uh, thought Watts was a kind of golden boy destined for greatness. Now, these words were written again nine days after the crime that you got this idea that he was a golden boy, a golden child. And you got that impression from his parents months later, the same thing. You know, when Cindy went on to national television, this was during the whole plea deal thing and that, that he was going to just, you know, accept uh, responsibility, plead guilty, that she was saying, you know, he was this perfect um, teenager, you know, he was this wonderful boy. And, and when you hear the family members talking to Chris Watts in those prison tapes, you also get a sense of, you know, he's this favored child or, or he's treated just as though he can do no wrong. And you even had his in-laws saying the same thing about him, you know, that he was sent by God and all that kind of thing. So 15 years after leaving high school, there was no gold, no greatness, and very little of that spirit of hope left. The aspiration to be a NASCAR chief technician shows us in colorful descriptive Im imagery how Chris Watts idealized himself, big, glamorous, where the action and the crowds were. And I, I do think what is very interesting with the, the NASCAR fairy tale you know, if Shanann's fairy tale was, you know, to have a family, to have children, to to have this sort of thriving lifestyle, you know, of a big house and um, faraway trips and, and whatnot, Chris Watts liked this idea of this kind of glamorous, um, action-packed lifestyle, you know, in the center of a pit crew um, as a NASCAR chief technician. And part of, we, we didn't know this at the time, of course, but it materialized later on that Chris Watts had gone to the Bandemir Speedway and that was on July the 21st and he would text Chenan, um, for example, at two minutes to two on July 21st, headed out to the track boo, right? I'll text you when I get there. And then he provided a concocted ruse regarding why I went to the speedway and all of that kind of thing. And so, you know, in the middle of his, this, this whole daydream, this whole roller coaster ride with Nicole Kessinger, part of the, the sights and sounds of this were, were the booming, smoking, um, the guttural roar of these engines, these dragsters, which was something that was sort of calling to him from childhood, you know, to something that he'd dreamed about as a as a youngster as a teenager and you know to some extent put out of his mind put out of his life and and so part of the whole uh, magic i guess when he was with kessinger was returning to the speedway with her and just being you know caught up in all of that the smell the sights the sounds uh, at bandabia speedway and then he also um, spoke about I think during the confession, he spoke about, you know, that was something that he did with his father that that or it might have come out in one, his, one of his letters that that was something that he did with his father. And, and it was a, like a favorite memory. Right. And if you think about Chris Watts in a very basic way, if you think about him as a glorified mechanic, if, or if you think about him as this exceptional mechanic, you know, what is a super mechanic? What, what is the Superman version of a mechanic? What's the sort of ultimate that a mechanic can become? Well, it's this. It's one of these dudes working at NASCAR or on the Formula One circuit. You know, it's like a racing, uh, racing track um, tech crew person. Do you get what I'm saying? And, and that's where he saw himself. And instead of that, in 2018, he wasn't even working as a mechanic. He was working as a ordinary fellow, you know, a operator in an oil field. You know, he'd fallen so far from his dreams. And I think in a weird way, Kessinger awakened something in him that, that made him remember or feel like, you know, there was something left, that, that there was still potential for a happily ever after, for, for some happiness in some shape or form. And if you take it even further than that, you know, there was a time where 
Shanand and Chris Watts were both involved in the sort of um, auto industry, both of them. Not only at Longmont Ford, where they both worked there, but also when they were in North Carolina. And, and we'll get to that in due course, but, you know, I think Shanann eventually moved away from her interest in in fast cars and all that kind of thing, whereas Kessinger seemed to be interested in that herself, according to what she said and according to what he said. And so you're getting this quite rich tapestry very early on, as I say, nine days after the incident. And one person could look at that and just shrug and say, okay, so what, he was a mechanic, so what, maybe he was interested in NASCAR. But we we later found out just how pertinent and relevant and significant that interest was based on what he himself said, not only that, but based on what he did, what he was doing when Shanann was away. You know, like, what did Chris Watts do when Shanann, when when the cat was away, what did the mouse do? How did the mouse play? Well, he went to Bandermere Speedway. And that was where his heart lay. That was him remembering his fairy tale. And the phone data review bears this out. So the phone data review was also reinforcing what was touched on for the very first time in this blog post on Shakedown on the 22nd, where it refers to numerous photos and um, kind of clips uh, that he took on his phone of dragsters at Bandimir, right? Um, image 770, or sorry, image 6199 to 6202, and then, and then uh, video clips 770, 775, 776, 778, 780, right? And then he also searched Google for topics like top fuel drags to burnout and top fuel drags to goes airborne, right? And so all of this is what he's interested in. And, you know, this is the kind of stuff that is moving him, right? He would be looking at this sort of thing online and sort of side by side with this would be pictures of Kessinger and pictures of them at the sand dune. So this was part of his fairy tale, this um, gritty, fiery, smoking, um, you know, uh, mechanical thing. You know, the dragsters and, and you know, these, these top-notch machines that, that he couldn't wait to, to work on. He would have loved to have been associated with that lifestyle, right? So although this was touched upon on the 22nd of August, um, I later touched on it again in another blog post on the 25th of September. So about a month and three days later, there was another blog post sort of reinforcing all of this. And um, I'm not going to talk too much about it here. We're almost at the 20-minute mark. But it's titled, Chris Watts voted most likely to succeed in the class of 2003. And just repeating again, you know, he was tremendously successful, smartest student I'd ever had. And we actually got some... Um, class photos from that time and you know we were kind of getting this weird thing was he was he really remarkably intelligent right and I kind of made a sly um, sarcastic remark about that saying you know a genius multiple um, killer who was caught and arrested within hours of committing his perfect crime right Um, I don't think so and I do think this flattering portrait of him, you know, that he was this incredibly intelligent mechanic made some people think that he was a lot smarter than I think he actually is. And I think I was one of those who who thought that 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 might be the case, that he was actually quite a um, clever person, right? And that the crime wasn't quite as dumb as it appeared. And it took a while for me to change my mind on that score. I, I do think the crime, there were the elements of it that are cr- quite crafty, but I think overall it was a pretty, the whole thing was was executed by a, a pretty dumb person. You know, the whole thing is dumb. But I think you've got to be careful being too dismissive and, and too, you know, 
whether someone is, is smart or clever or of average intelligence, when it comes to, to, to true crime, you've got to look at something and say, okay, regardless of what you may think of someone relative to yourself or relative to whatever, what were the actual dynamics going on there? This is if you want to understand what was going on. And so in that second blog post from September was another really interesting observation, which I think went over most people's heads. It was just so obvious in a way that people didn't really realize the import of it. And that was Joe Duty saying, you know, he remembered his former student as extremely introverted and quiet. He didn't say, you know what, he was an introvert. He was a little bit quiet. He was extremely introverted. So this was a very unusual character for some reason he was introverted not just introverted but very very introverted for some reason he was quiet and crushed in for some reason and he went on to say you know watts would sit in class and hardly say a word why and he would say that others who remember watts from high school described him as a boy that every girl had a crush on but shy and awkward and i think somewhere in the in the canon of information around this case, he was aware that girls liked him, but, but he never really knew what to do with that. He lacked game, as um, Amanda Thayer said. I think even Shanann Watts felt the same way, that you know he had a certain aura about him, but when you got to know him, he was quite a cardboard character in, in the sense that he, there wasn't so much you know, even though he was quite quiet, it wasn't though he was kind of hiding away a, a great deal of depth of character. Not that he wasn't hiding anything. I mean, one of the things that was underneath was this fairy tale, you know, of NASCAR and wanting to be successful, wanting to have a better life. And I think at the time that the, this crime happened, his life was nose diving. It was like in a, a crash dive um, that he was he was trying to get out of. You know, he felt like th the the trajectory that the family were on was like nose diving, um, you know, into the ground, almost like those pilots in the Second World War with the Spitfires. You know, if they get shot down, they they just start diving. And, you know, he, he is looking for a parachute. He's trying to get out of that situation. That's the kind of impression I get from that. So he had a big glamorous f uh, idea of what he wanted for himself, this NASCAR chief technician. It was quite an idealization of what he wanted. He wanted to be where the action was and the crowds were. Instead, he's visiting sites like Serbia 319, you know, the, the sort of quiet, derelict, um, situation, right? Tinkering with the pipes and, and turning off leaks and things like that. So reality turned out to be very different from that fairy tale. And so what do you, what do you do when that happens? What do you do when r what you've imagined, what you've daydreamed is this complete mismatch? You know, what do you do with it? Well, you can feel humiliated. You can feel angry and resentful. You can feel frustrated and, and, now, they, you know, there were no crowds, no excitement, no glamour, just the daily grind toiling with grease and oil and scrubbing to get the muck off his skin each day. Scott Peterson sold fertilizer solvents for a living. It was a long fall from the dizzy heights of the golfing great he always dreamed of becoming. The thing is, what do you do with that? What do you do with that mismatch? It's difficult to say what the implications are of the house in Belmont, west of Charlotte, except to say that it belonged to Shanann. She'd bought it in 2009. The couple were married three years after that in 2012. According to the Denver Post, the new owner, Byron Falls, said that um, the Watts were in a hurry to sell and left all the furniture behind. What does that mean? I said it might mean that they were trying to outrun their debts at that point already in, um, you know, around about 2012. And I'm not going to go through the rest of this article, but because it does go on. So if you're interested, you can head on to the link and read about the three new insights. And then you can also read further dealing with kind of a supplementary or complementary blog post dealing with um, Chris Watts when, you know, when he was in high school, what his, his teachers thought of him.
If you've enjoyed these first five episodes in the series so far on the Shaitan blogs, make sure you don't miss the sixth episode. That, that one is going to be a humdinger. So, so thank you for listening. I'll see you guys next time for episode six in this ongoing series.